Hi, everybody. Welcome to week 30 of the ENM 2020 course. Uh, this week was a little bit of a change of pace where we, we stopped talking about methodology and theory for, for these tools in distributional ecology. And instead, we started talking about some very general issues in science about, you know, we, we, we do these analyses and we publish our papers and then it can be awfully hard for other scientists to use those same tools or to replicate our results. And that reflects very, very poorly on science. Uh, other fields within science have called this the reproducibility crisis because they've come to realize that um, large chunks of their literature are not results that could be reproduced even by somebody working in that field who's very familiar with those methods. And so this is kind of a uh, something that happened within the last year or two where I know of three or four major efforts to work to assure quality, uniformity, documentation, reproducibility of results in this field of, of, of distributional ecology. So we have a, a nice panel today. Um, the, the usual cast of characters, Marlon and Mona, but we are really happy to have Damaris Zarel and Maria Luisa Mondelli with us. Um, and Damaris contributed one of the talks this week, and Maria Luisa will be giving a talk later in the course, both of those about reproducibility. So let's jump right in. Um, I'm gonna share my screen to be able to go over to the questions. Let's see. This is always a pain. There's, there is our course plan. There are the questions. Okay. Anybody have a question they'd like to jump into? I'll, I'll start you guys off. Uh, let's look at the very first question. Uh, despite explaining in detail all the question, all, all the steps carried out for our niche models, do you consider that providing the R code is also a crucial element for reproducibility? I think yes. <laughs> well, I would do it at least. I mean, I will not always require it as an editor or as a reviewer, um, but I tend more and more towards providing my code always. It's um, a good idea. And then you can clarify things and also um, make it a well, really reproducible, right? Everybody can, can work with your codes afterwards um, and, and can cite you when they're using your code. So, yes. I, mean, I, I think I'm probably the person who should object to that question because I'm not conversant in R. And so I'm perpetually dependent on having students who are smarter than me, uh, two of whom are on this call, um, one former, Mona. Um, but yeah, it makes such a difference. You know, if I say um, I did a principal components analysis using the such and such function in such and such package, to begin with, that requires that the person have the same software platform. But also, you know, even if you tell me what function you've used, there's usually some detail that you don't specify. If I have your code, then I'm, it's all pre-specified. I know exactly what you did and what settings. So, I mean, I think even, even though it causes me unending problems now, because much of my science I still do without coding. And so it means that I have reviewers and editors who say, well, provide your code. I don't have any. But 
I think it's it's a key element in reproducibility. I think I think it has two advantages, <clears throat> and it's from my point of view. First, uh, nowadays because of the amount of analysis we do, we generally end up using dozens of functions in R, for instance, and specifying each in each part of your methods. Uh, each program, each package, and each function. Uh, maybe a little bit too much, but if you say the function, if you say the package, and then you provide the entire code, it's it's a lot better. Like the code is a lot better than anything that you can write because other people is actually seeing what you did. And it also it's also good for science because when you do coding, other people can do what you did and see your mistakes and that's science like it's about correcting it's about improving it's about like growing uh and and that that that's especially good when you're trying to like set a set of knowledge or 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 uh make something new so other people can actually check your work the way you did it not just the way you present it and, and not just checking your work, but they can also use your methods and cite your work because they can just essentially plop in their data, you know, replacing uh, your data and run exactly your analyses. And that's, a, that's an exciting feature and it makes for immediate um, elevation of impact because if you present an interesting analysis and somebody else thinks wow I'd love to try that on my data set well the easiest way to make it possible for them to try that on their data set is to give them all the code yes, Absolutely. And, and this is considered to be a, um, a good practice for reproducibility so you can think of your R script or Python script or any, any kind of code as a recipe for what you're doing. So sharing this recipe is a way to share the story of your analysis in another way than the, the paper. So uh, I agree with you all. Okay, I'm, I'm muting my microphone at intervals because our next door neighbor decided to um, use an air blower to clean her walk. Um, I'm gonna share my screen again and let's look at another question. Uh, anybody have one that is exciting? I thought this one was fun. Um, with this course, you're raising the standards of, of niche modeling around the world. So are you thinking that you're making uh, competition for yourselves? What a good thing to do, right? Yeah. Which is to say, if we can raise the, the level of discourse in distributional ecology so that uh, there's, there's a better methodological level across the field, then that that improves the whole field and we all learn more. So yeah, let's have some fun, friendly, positive competition. That's great. I love it when I see a, a paper that I, you know, that I'm reviewing and it's very well done. I have, you know, no major methodological disagreements with it and I've never met or heard of the authors. That's really fun. Yeah. Dawn, you had a question highlighted uh, after the first one we discussed. Uh, so the next one, 28, 29. Uh -huh. I think that's also interesting. How, how reproducible should our research be? <laughs> Which would be an uh, acceptable level? Um, and it's not, I don't think it's a, I don't know, a funny question. It, it's, it's real. Sometimes, even if we provide all the details we used in our research, 
uh, there are some randomization tests that, you know, you don't replicate. <laughs> you cannot get the exact same results because of randomization or, or other, other um, non-unique events, let's call them. I don't know how else to call them. But I think being able to follow the steps and get to hopefully the same result, uh, barring again, um, steps that, that require uh, randomization and other, um, other processes, we should be able to at least follow all the steps and get to the same or a very, very similar uh, outcome. And if we don't, then it means that, that uh, we just did a sensitivity analysis on that particular study and uh, that one step that was not fixed uh, generates results that are slightly different. And that's also you know, good to know. There was, I, I read a paper some time ago, and now I can't remember the details, but there was a paper that was, that was uh, arguing that not getting the same results is also progress. <laughs> so the fact that sometimes a study is not reproducible means that we learn something <laughs> and we move forward from that, that particular, I don't know, uh, learning experience or uh, teachable moment. So I think, I think being very transparent about everything you did, all the steps you did, sometimes, sometimes reproduce, um, studies are not reproducible because the authors decided not to disclose some information or were, and this, not, not the first one, but the second one, B, would be, we are in a rush to write the paper and we, you know, we skip over some details that we think, oh, it's, it's just, you know, everybody knows that. Um, and that, that has happened to me, you know, you write, you, know, you write a paper and you either forget or you think, oh, this, must, this is not needed. Uh, and then your study is, is not reproducible. But I think it's worse when, when authors decide not to provide a certain detail like, I don't know, the georeferencing error, <laughs> my old friend, uh, georeferencing error was, you know, 25 kilometers and the environmental data resolution was one kilometer. So I think that's, that's worse when, when authors decide not to provide certain information that would make the study look less robust or less, um, yeah, I less think, robust. I think the word is to obfuscate. Obfuscate. You know, <laughs> deliberately set out not to be reproducible or clear. Uh, I recently, this is a little bit off topic, but I recently heard a, um, it was like an extended reporting on how a person broke the lottery system in the United States. So we have these lotteries that, you know, everybody buys, not me, but uh, people <laughs> buy $1 lottery tickets and you're trying to guess, let's say six numbers. And if you guess all six of them, then you win a huge amount of money. And more recently, groups of states have assembled so that the the amount of money gets even larger and there was a really interesting um happening where a guy wins a 20 million dollar jackpot but then refuses to show up in person to pick up his money you know or to to claim his money and he ended up sending a canadian lawyer and it just it awoke just a little bit of suspicion. And, you know, nobody knew who this person was and the Canadian lawyer wasn't talking. But little by little, they figure out that the person at the center of a bunch of people winning the lottery was the head of security for the lottery system. <laughs> and that he had hired the Canadian lawyer that his brother had won a lottery in another state, that a woman that he used to date won the lottery in another state. And this is over the course of a decade. 
Wow. And what he had done, it was the opposite of reproducibility. You know, lotteries are supposed to be absolutely unpredictable. And so they use a, a random number generator that has as its seed the value taken from a Geiger counter. You know, so it's just kind of number noise. And so it's, it's designed to be completely irreproducible. Hmm. But this guy inserted in the code that three days a year, instead of having essentially an infinite number of possibilities, like 50 million possible combinations of the set of numbers, instead of that, there were fewer than 100 possible numbers. Wow. And then, you know, he, he was dating this woman, they broke up, but she was going to get married to another guy. And he said, hey, you know, I'd like to give you a wedding present. <laughs> Next week, play these 100 lottery numbers and boom, she wins. Anyhow, that's kind of where reproducibility was something he was trying for. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean... It, those are really good points, Mona, that there are different kinds of non-reproducibility. There's kind of the deliberate obfuscation. There's that kind of careless lack of detail. Or, you know, sometimes it's even the journal says, you know, you're over a w word limit. Or, you know, the methods section is too long. And then I think, you know, there's every intention of being fully reproducible and it just you can't give enough detail and so that's what maria luisa will be talking about near the end of the course where if you have a different operating system on your computer that can instill differences maybe small differences but differences in the outcomes and so she's been exploring technologies to make things absolutely reproducible. And it's a lot of work. You yeah. have a huge audience that day, Maria Luisa. <laughs> <laughs> Go yeah, ahead. I, would, I would also say it's a super difficult question to answer, like what is the acceptable level? I mean, any step towards reproducibility will be highly beneficial and we are all um, still in the infancy of that process we all still have to learn a lot it's it's also a learning process for ourselves that we have to learn what is reproducibility um, i'm i'm looking forward to hearing what maria luisa has to to say like uh, also my postdocs tell me um, that we should actually move towards um, providing containers for example if we would really like to make everything's replicable and these are things that I never heard of before but but just making a, a try for reproducibility and going away from this thinking that I want to have my research for myself but being outspoken about it and communicate all the little bits um, also uh, for an educational purpose that I think every future student who would read my paper he he or she will not have any problems of reproducing it because I want to describe everything in detail. I want to uh, provide my code so that people don't have to um, fiddle around with this code again and spend months that I already um, did. Um, so every action towards this level of reproducibility will be highly helpful. And um, then we all learn together as a community. We've had a couple of talks from Dan Warren in the last few weeks. And Warren kind of, his debut in the distribution ecology world was with this fantastic paper about real methods for comparing niches, 2008 in evolution. And about a year or two before that paper was published, Jorge Soveron and I got this message from, from this graduate student, you know, Dan Warren, um, asking if we could give him the data from our 1999 paper in science, where we first started talking about niche conservatism. And you know, so that was a, let's say a seven year, seven years later than the original paper. And I remember, you know, our offices are 20, 30 meters apart. 
we bumped into each other and it was like, oh, did you see that message from that, from that, that student of Michael Torelli's? Do you have the data? You know, and then I, I thought you had the data. And it took us a day or two and we found the data. We found the, you know, and it was the sort of thing where you go, oh, we were so lucky. I didn't want to have to say no. But it was luck. And that's not reproducible science. I mean, in that case, it was certainly not deliberate. And that was certainly the, the science culture of you know, those decades. But we can now do far, far, far better. You know, data sets, intermediate data products, software, program code, it can all be made available very easily now. And so we should be. I just want to make uh, clear that the intention of reproducibility and all what we can do to make it uh, uh, reproducible, the things we do, doesn't mean uh, as the reader or as someone that wants to reproduce that, you don't have, you just have to use that and run it. Uh, uh, you have to learn the, the certain things that you have to use, right? the tools and stuff like that. That, that those kind of things facilitate your 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 life as a as someone that wants to reproduce that, but still the knowledge that you have to have in basic things like at least R or things like that, uh, it's still necessary. So I just don't want to have another a question uh, next next week. Like uh, so, we don't have to learn R to be able to reproduce, but you you probably even even probably you even don't have to, to learn it, but uh, you're not going to understand probably some of the steps. There are certain parts in the code in which you like decompose certain objects and, and, and try to like explore the information inside the program. And that's very important sometimes. It's critical some, in some times. Yeah. So that's, that's in, it's good to learn those things. Well, and, and beyond that, if you don't have a theoretical conceptual basis for the analyses that you want to do, you will mess it up. You know, that's, that's, um, that's why this course is so long because we've taken so long, so much effort to relate everything back to the concepts and the theory. Here's a question from my friend, Jung Ganglo. Um, he says, thanks very much. I'm interested by the full steps of reproducibility of ENM and would like to know if observing all those steps has no inconveniency like facilitating plagiarism. So interesting question from Jean. Um, my feeling personally is that imitation is the highest form of praise. And so, you know, if somebody decides to snag some chunk of what I've done, I feel like I've been praised. I don't want to facilitate that, obviously. But my comment is more that, that um, making it possible to rerun anal an analysis or to transfer an analysis to another system, another species, another landscape, that doesn't make a publishable paper. The publishable paper is what we put around it. And that's also why we have a peer review process. Our peer reviewers hopefully know the literature and are aware of what has been published before. It doesn't always work, but I'd much rather have concrete reproducible science and a little bit of risk of somebody doing something inappropriate than to have science that is opaque and not reproducible. Now, I've, you know, I have been the subject of plagiarism before. Um, one time I was reviewing a paper by people that I even knew and the introduction, these were, these were people for whom English was not a first language. And 
at the end of the introduction, I thought, well, you know, this is a good, a good, you know, well-founded analysis. It's doing something that is interesting and publishable. But the, the English is going to take a lot of work. And then I get to the methods, and the English was, at least to my view, the English was perfect. Like, exactly the way I would have written it. And then after a paragraph or two, I thought, wait a minute, that is not just exactly the way I would have written it, it's exactly the way I did write it. And it was, it was exactly what I had written a couple years earlier with a, with a colleague. Um, and I ended up having to report this instance of just kind of blatant copying to the editor and the editor brought it to the attention of these people that I knew and it was very uncomfortable, but the system worked and that paper wasn't published. It was a long time ago. Yeah, I also think that reproducibility is different from plagiarism. I mean, also, I mean, that's a very strong example that you provided, um, Town, that they actually copied every single word, but that normally um, reproducing methods in your paper that somebody else has already used before is not or a plagiarism uh, per se, right? Uh, you still have to, as you said, you still have to have your own objective, your own study question, and these, uh, all the considerations following this objective need to be ecologically sound and methodologically sound. Um, and just that you used a, a method or a workflow that somebody else has published before and made available, made reproducible, um, this doesn't mean that it's necessarily plagiarism. Plagiarism is if you really copy um, the wording uh, word by word or the analysis themselves. I mean, we are talking about methods and not um, replicating analysis on a specific um, study and publishing it again. Um, so, so these are two different things. And I, I think it's also some or it, it should become more common sense that actually making our methods reproducible and available um, should also be a responsibility as we are all paid by tax money. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I think to me, the, the, the definition of plagiarism is not necessarily the, the fact of using, as you said, a workflow or a process from somebody else. The question is, do you cite the source and make it clear that that code or process is from another person? You can even use text from another person, but that's why we put it in quotation marks to make it absolutely crystal clear that this particular text comes from a particular previously published uh, bit of 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 intellectual contribution. So yeah, the 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 crucial thing is the is the clarity. Other questions? Yeah, there were a few questions. Um, starting with a with a second one on uh, two eight three zero, and then more later there were a couple of questions that was that were a bit technical towards the odd map like what uh, um, should we just complete all the items of the of the odd map list um, should we include it um, in the method section um, i had a paper submitted late, lately and the editor or the reviewer said that the method section is uh, too long there were a couple of questions um, in this direction um, and maybe just like a small technical answer to that. So in principle, yes, when you um, have the OTMAP list, ne um, never mind whether it's the OTMAP Shiny app or whether it's the OTMAP table, um, in principle, you can just uh, fill in all the fields that we marked as obligatory. Um, but you also need to think about what is your study objective, what additional optional fields should be part of it. Um, 
that's the current state. It might change in the future. Um, if we uh, see that some items have to be adapted or revised. Uh, for where you should include it in the paper, um, I think it will definitely blow up your paper if you have all of the methods uh, described in such detail to make it reproducible. So I would always recommend uh, just fill in the OTMAP table, also in valid points really, just, just fill in so that you, uh, while you're working, don't do it at the end of your, um, of your um, analysis, but do it while you are doing your analysis to lock down what you have done. Also to remember later, you might have a half a year break for whatever reason, um, and you come back to your work once you have time, and then you don't know anymore what you have been doing. You don't know anymore what code is um, the, the most um, uh, actual one, and so on and so on. So just lock it down while you're working, and in the end, you should um, dynamically have the OTMAP table finished. And you can always put that in a, a supplementary material of a paper. And this is what we would recommend. While we would say focus on this overview part that we have put together that should really give a succinct but um, detailed enough summary of what your work, what your SDM is about. And this is what I would put into um, the methods part of the paper. And there was another question asking whether some bits uh, could also be contained in, in other parts of the paper, in the, in the introduction or in the discussion. Of course, I mean, you, you can um, put it where you see fit. What we regard as important for, for the OTMAP is just that you have a, um, a central place where all of the information is contained so that we don't, if we want to, uh, repeat your study or analysis that we don't have to search through your entire paper. But of course, you do mention already in the introduction that you attempt a species distribution model for the alpine shrew and you want to make predictions into the future. Um, of course, you can mention that in the introduction, but um, this, I th the crucial part for me is to have the OTMAP table as a complete list in the supplement. So this will really help uh, future reproducibility and meta-analysis. I, I think having that all together in one place is very crucial because, you know, the, the way we express in, in text in a, in a paper may have, you know, may, maybe all that information is there, maybe not, but if it is there, it's not going to be in such a structured format and so easily accessible. So, you know, again, um, putting digital objects online is now extremely easy. So let's just do it. You know, we, we're in the final steps of submitting a paper from my lab group. And yeah, the ODMAP um, summary is going as a supplementary material. And I, th I think that that is related, we can relate that to a question on line 2854. Uh, well, there are three questions in that uh, entry, but the second question asks, asks, how many ENM users will actually follow the recommendations to ensure reproducibility? And if we have tools like ODMAP, I think more and more people will do that. Uh, I agree. It's a bit of a, you know, it's a bit of a um, problem that at the end of, of a paper, you writing, at the end of writing a paper, you decide, okay, now I'm going to create that table, that supplementary table that has absolutely all the information that I have in a notebook, in some online notes and wherever. I think, I think people get you know, tired and just want to submit that paper and they, they don't want to create that supplementary material that has all the information that is maybe located in, in various places. Um, so yes, having, I understand, that's a good question. I don't know how many, <laughs> at least uh, in the, you know, in the next couple of years, maybe like, like you said, Damaris, this is new to all of us. We are all trying to be 
better scientists and, and have studies that are reproducible, or published studies that are reproducible. Um, so we are in the kind of in the beginnings, I think, in the, at least in the ENM field. Um, so we'll see how many will actually follow the recommendations in the next few years. There's also and there a... might be other recommendations coming up. I mean, this is just one example that we uh, came up with from, from our um, frustration that uh, we are, <laughs> but it's just one example. And in, in, in a couple of years, there, there might be a better um, recommendation. But There's just starting a, a it. There's dimension of, of journals driving good behavior by people. So to me, the, the, the nice example, the successful example is open data in the, in the molecular genetics world. And basically every major journal in that field says, if you want to publish analyses based on uh, DNA sequences, you have to put your sequence data on GenBank. Mm -hmm. And so now we have this absolutely massive storehouse of molecular sequence data. Well, it's, I think it's time for uh, protocols and, and things like that to be required by journals. And so, Damaris, do I remember that one journal has already required ODMAP? I'm not well, remembering encouraged. which one. Yeah. Which one? They encouraged it, um, diversity and distributions, yeah. Okay, well, as editor-in-chief of biodiversity informatics with our tiny little piece of the market, um, <laughs> I think it's, it's an obvious thing for us to do as well. And we can go beyond encourage and we can require. So, um, I think it's not, we'll, it's not that difficult, right? It's, it's not, it's a, it's a shiny app. Even I can do that, <laughs> right? And also, you know, because a couple decades ago, she was part of the, the move to get me to move out of Arc View and into Arc Map, right? Yeah, but that was 2000 and three down. That's history. <laughs> now Marlon's part of the move to try to get me to move out of the Stone Age and into R. And that has happened to me with, with Shao, so <laughs> I understand you now. <laughs> These are hard things, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one, thing, one thing I realized when I was doing the OD map at the end of, of my paper, like of finishing everything, is that my methods like were in good enough to make my work reproducible and so that's also something good about that like you learn from your own mistakes and it makes it it makes it better because i had to change some parts of my writing but now it, it's it's a lot better <clears throat> i think that's the utility of both um odmap and the checklist from xiao um these are both things that, that remind us of the additional things we should be doing. Maybe it's in the next study, but it, they, they're essentially, let's say, positive reinforcement. Uh, there was another one which I put in the, in the literature for, for my introductory talk, um, which was more of a grading system. And so you might be given, you know, uh, a, a gold rating for data openness, but you might be given a, you know, a very poor rating for some other section. And yet you can go into why you got that poor rating. But I think, I think I like the positive encouragement rather than the, the negative, you know, downgrading of, you know, getting just a bronze or a deficient in a particular dimension, uh, I think we can we can have a much better impact on our field if we if we um, if we remind people of how to do more and do better. Another question.
Well, there is one about data, sharing data or getting access to data. Okay. Uh, it's on 2834. And I think that's, that's a, a, a sticky point. That's a difficult point with um, reproducibility. Um, not all scientists want to provide, to give access to all their data. Um, yeah, so the question uh, uh, asks, okay, uh, so if we would be using exclusively data sampled by us in the field, what repositories can we use to upload all the data as we do with genetic data uploading to uh, GenBank, for example? I don't really know uh, if particulars can upload data to GBIF, so, there is, uh, so is there any other platform or database we can um, do it? And I would say Dryad would be the one that comes in my mind because Dryad is, well, it's not free actually, it depends on the institution. Um, but- Figshare is, is free. I'm sorry? Figshare is free. Figshare. So, so there are options, sorry, Tom. Go no, ahead. go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say there are some options. Uh, I, I, as far as I, I'm not up to date with GB, uh protocols, but as far as I know from a few years ago, you can just simply upload your own data. Uh, but there are other options like Dryad and Figshare you said, Tom. So the, the, there is a difference between those, those two options. Um, and this will take us to a concept that I threw out into the literature with some colleagues in Brazil a few years ago, of uh, digital accessible knowledge. And it's been a little bit debated, but I'll, I'll stand by it. Digital obviously is the only way where you can make copies and, and share things quickly, instantly, globally. Accessible means it's gotta be somewhere where it can be found and, and um, obtained. But the interesting part is this thing of knowledge. And it was suggested by other groups that it should be you know, digital accessible data or information. But we opted for knowledge for a very specific reason, which was that knowledge is when you take data and, and kind of modular information and integrate it into a bigger whole. And so imagine I do a study and I put my data on Dryad or Figshare. Those data are not in any way integrated into the broader set of data that are out there about biological diversity. Maybe we're talking primary occurrence data. And so it's very useful and it certainly makes my particular study reproducible. Here's the data set. But in some sense, it fails to put those data out there in a format where they can be immediately and seamlessly integrated into the broader, um, the broader universe of data. So, you know, the GenBank example is a very good one where everybody's using the same platform, everybody's documented in the same metadata formats. And so your sequence data and everybody else's sequence data are immediately integrated. And on GBIF, everybody's data is in Darwin Core format. And so at least at a, at a higher level, your data are, are organized in the same way and the same concepts are in the same fields. But if I just put you know, a CSV file or, or something like that on, on Dryad or Figshare or on my institutional repository, those data are not easily integrated into the broader whole. So uh, if I remember right, GBIF is making it more feasible for uh, non-GBIF participants to share data to GBIF, which I think is very, very uh, intelligent. Um, but at the very least, getting your data into the standard format for primary biodiversity occurrence data, which is Darwin core format, 
I think that ought to be a prerequisite because it assures that the data can, can be integrated fairly seamlessly. And that, that was on your last, last slide, the fair data. So findable. If, if we have data somewhere on Figshare, which I vaguely remember seeing at some point, but I don't use Figshare, so clearly it's not I, I'm not finding those data because I'm not using Figshare. I'm using GBIF, but not Figshare. And I, you know, if I, I work on three species, I will go on Dryad and check for three species. But if people who work with hundreds of species probably are not going to check Dryad for hundreds of species. So findable, <laughs> the F in the fair data uh, framework, or I don't know, thinking about data. Um, that, that, yeah, that's super important not just sharing, but being data being visible, being uh, us being able to find those data. And coming up on an hour, um, anybody have another last question they want to take on? Okay, anybody have any last comments you want to make? Wow, everybody's quiet. <laughs> I'm still uh, trying to read through the questions again, whether there is something urgent missing. <laughs> so, I mean, there were a few technical questions still that I uh, found again. I would just recommend um, read the paper. It's open access. <laughs> and I hope we have uh, provided most of the recommendations that you were apparently missing uh, from or descriptions that were missing from um, my presentation. So I hope that the paper can actually answer most of that. There was a question uh, about IUCN in line 284, mm. no, 54, whether we could give examples where ENM results have been considered for IUCN <laughs> status categorization. Do you know any, like the other instructors? I, um, I wouldn't know by heart. I would have to look it up again. Uh, it's, it's only a case where um, it, you actually use bioclimatic models for future predictions and then um, you have to, yeah. So it's worth looking into this red list guidelines. I mean, you still have to adhere to, um, to the status, um, process that um, the predictions have to indicate that the populations, for example, will decrease by 30% over the next three um, generations, etc. So these are quite strict guidelines for when you would actually include bioclimatic um, models in the um, status, um, what, how you call it, in the status process categorization, exactly. Um, I'm not aware of any example now, but um, the guidelines are quite strict That's um, and quite clear. Uh, that's all I can say there. Maybe the others have an example? I don't have one on the tip of my tongue, uh, but I do know that they have been used kind of at two steps. One is characterizing current range extent and the other is looking at future trends. Um, the US National Audubon Society has been moving a whole set of uh, future projections of niche models, trying to create essentially a climate red list. But that is, I believe, still outside of the IUCN status categorization. Okay, well, let's, let's uh, wrap things up and I'll thank everybody for tuning in and thank uh, Maria Luisa and Damaris and of course Mona and Marlon for, for joining me today and um, coming up this next week is the controversy about modeling and predicting abundance patterns across species ranges. So tune in for that and see you next week.